Good evening to all of you who are joined online. Um, my name is Padraig Leahy of the Cork Region Committee of Engineers Ireland. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture, which will deal with the past, present and future of engineering education, the profession and the institution itself in the Cork region. We have uh, two heavy hitting speakers tonight, both of them doctors, both fellows of Engineers Ireland. First up, we have Dr. Barry O'Connor, um, President Emeritus of CIT, the man who led CIT into the transition of now MTU. Um, Barry has worked in industry as an electrical engineer. He's lectured in both UCC and CIT, and for a number of years was president um, at CIT. Dr. Mary Maloney is a lecturer and researcher at the Department of Civil Structural and, and Environmental Engineering at NO, MTU, and for years at CIT. Um, Mary is a, herself a former chair of the Cork Region of Engineers Ireland, um, and her father is a former chair of the Cork Region of Engineers Ireland, and she is a strong advocate and indeed a strong role model for female participation in STEM. So now I shall hand you over to Barry O'Connor. Right. Thank you, Padraig. Are we receiving that? We are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Padraig. And uh, um, I will kick off the this half of the talk and hand over to Mary eventually. Um, and I guess what I'll be doing is a bit of like the ghost of Christmas past to bring you up to the present and then Mary will do the present and the future. So maybe just to, to, to kick off, if I can. Yeah, we're up to that. So I'd probably give a bit of background there. As I say, I started off at the MNB in England and Wales, worked in Voyage, Neskeaton, and then spent a long time in UCC where I got some really, really interesting sabbaticals, Paris, Portugal, Michigan State and Alpha Laval in Sweden to, to begin with, so in reverse order there. Uh, now, I will begin with a bit of a historical background to all this, and I'm reminded of a, uh, a lecture I went to a number of years ago, and an, an eminent gentleman um, gave um, a history, he started off by saying, I'm an amateur historian, and gave a talk, uh, some historical matters, and the conclusion at the end of the night from some learned colleagues was, he was an amateur historian. I'm sure being the worst. I'm not a historian, but we, we, we'll drive on and give a bit of background to engineering education and the influence that engineering has had in Cork generally over the years. So basically, um, this first slide here I'm putting up, um, about three or four years ago, I had caused to visit the Institute of Technology, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and I went into the, the head of innovation. And it's a pretty, pretty big Institute of Technology now over in New Jersey. And they had this poster above on the wall. And, um, and the, the hashtag, as we call it now, was you don't know Jersey. And went in to deal with this chap, a head of innovation. And sure, I knew who the guy was up on the wall. It was, it was the bold John Philip Holland. So, it, you know, I kind of using it as a bit of a team for tonight. Does Cork know engineering? And I think the 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 the, the, the suggestion for tonight's topic is maybe something that we, we we could broadcast a bit more around the city and around the region, how vital engineering is to to to, to Cork. So so that's John Philip Holland, um, the details of him. And I just mentioned a few engineers as we go along. Um, John Philip Holland uh, was born in the Scanner. His parents were both from from Belly Martel, uh, Hurling Stronghold. Uh, he was a Christian brother, uh, taught above the North Monastery, where he came under the influence of a, a brother, Burke. Um, eventually, in the 1890s, because he was involved in another brotherhood uh, of, of a Fenian variety, he got himself up to New Jersey, where he developed the, the first engine, the first submarine. And I think it was called a ship destroyer at the time, rather than a, 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 rather than a, a submarine. So he was one of the earlier educators and engineers in, in, in the Cork area. John Philip Holland, he received the highest award possible for a civilian from the Tsar of Russia, from the Emperor of Japan. And to this day, there is a, a, there is a submarine. That was all before World War I. So to this day, there is a, a, there is a submarine named after him in the, in, the, in, the, in the US Navy. 
Um, so I do remember when, when I went to school in the North Manchester myself, and we were told one day that a, a brother below the tech of all places had actually invented the submarine. We said, yeah, pull the other one. But in fact, the man went on to develop about, to lodge about 25 patents uh, on submarine, submarine technology. He broke his leg one time and didn't get into work for a while. So he was also fascinated with, with flight. And he designed uh, uh, an aerofile, patented it. And some years later, the, the Wright brothers went into the US patent office and filed their first patent. And the guy behind the counter said, sorry, we have one of them. So that was one of our first Cork engineers. So just to go back another small bit, a great book worth looking at, Kieran McCarthy, uh, about the, the what eventually became the Royal Cork Institution in 1803. And that's the syllabus for 1803, 1804, which includes logic, maths, experimental sciences, chemistry and agriculture. So that was the first technical education in Cork. It developed on from there, if you can see the, the, the on the slide there, the Royal Cork Institution, it knows that this work it does, uh, evolved into the Queen's College Cork, which is in UCC. It evolved eventually, the other part into the Crawford Technical Institute, the RTC, CIT and MTU as of 1st January this year. And on the other side of the, of, the, of the fence, which I can't see there, my screen is, but on the other side, you have developments in ANCO, became FOSS, became SOLUS. So SOLUS and CARC VEC came together. they become the, 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 the CARC Education Training Board. And eventually, again, this is just this last year, a new department has been set up to, to break down the barriers and, and to, 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 to break down the barriers between the different types of education further higher education, research, innovation, and science, all under, under one uh, department. Um, I'll just give some interesting little stories. Somebody might know them already, but I've called this one the, a tale of two engineers, one, Larry Poland, and the other, the late Richard Egan. Uh, and Larry, if you're, if you're online tonight, I uh, hope you're keeping well. So back in the 80s, EMC, Richard Egan and colleagues were, were traveling the world to find a location for the for the new factory for 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 for, for data storage from memory, uh, mainframe memory systems, and went out to the car car to see at the time. Met Larry Poland and gave the presentation the, with the idea. And Larry said to them, "My name is Larry Poland. I'm head of electronic engineering in CIT or in car car to see what can we do for you?" And Larry, uh, Dick Egan eventually became the Irish ambassador. They set up the factory outside in Ovens, and he always told everyone Larry Poland was the reason that we were in Cork. He told that story to Mary McAleese, and she told it back to Matt Cottrell and other people who bought it as well. So, but to, 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 just to give the link between Cork RTC and EMC and what your university should be doing, when EMC was set up outside in Ovens, it started off fairly basic, but then the technology improved. So the staff had to be trained up to become actual technicians. Courses were developed by Cork Car to CCIT for all that. Eventually, the technicians needed bachelor's degrees because it had improved again in terms of the, 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 the work going on and the, 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 the quality of the technology. And again, bachelor's programs were developed. And eventually, the, what happened, uh, we moved on into cloud computing. And cloud computing, the first online masters in the world in cloud computing, was developed by CIT in conjunction with EMC. And today, there's still great connection between CIT and Dell, and indeed between UC and Dell, and now between MTU and Dell. And of course, just to, to mention, Bob Savage was chair, in, inaugural chair of, of the MTU, and did two stints as, as chair of governing, governing body of, of CIT. My point is, folks, the connection between industry and third level education is, is, is vital. I'm going to move on very quickly. Again, another great book here worth, worth buying for Christmas. Uh, it traces the it's a great social history of, of Cork in the 80s. It's called Crisis and Comeback. And, and if you see it uh, on, the, on the screen there, the, 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 the story is told by the screen itself. We can judge this book by its cover. This is the Ford Cartier, I think, which, you know, at that back in the 80s, Ford, Dunlops, Jerome, all shut down. But what came in was Apple. We had the jazz festival set, established, and I know there's, there's, there'll be two pints going for this in the MCQ afterwards. The statue was not back to the Christian Brothers. That was the moving statue below in Ballon Spittal, Shinshkelele. Again, the terrible times in Cork. Morpheus is about to close down as well. And what happened? Thanks to the likes of, of Larry Poland, EMC came in. Thanks to 
like said, Dan Byrne, another good engineer, EM, uh, Apple was established, General Sound Semiconductor was established outside Macron. The pharma sector developed again because of the very strong um, uh, science and technology, both in car car to see and UCC. And again, if you, if you think it wasn't just locally in here in Cork, uh, the late uh, Louis O'Halloran, uh, his courses supplied engineers to Dick and Galway and, and, and Clonmel. Heineken solved the issue of Murphy's. And what was key then in Cork as well, the NMRC was established by, by Jerry Rickson, which supplied engineers and technicians to EMC, Apple, General Semiconductor, and a whole bevy of, of industries coming in at that stage. So education was key to the whole thing. Can I just hark back then to uh, the, the, I suppose the interaction between the, the institution and, and CIT and MTU now? The, the valued industry, strong industry input is extremely valued by, by all universities, but particularly by, by MTU. Currently, over 60 professional bodies accredited degree programs in MTU. MTU employs both a professional and an academic external examiner, which means that both the, the, the programs drop the date academically and also relevant professionally. And that, that's brought in, into, into play as well in terms of new program approval and every five years and programs are, 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 are reviewed. So that's, that's, that's key. Um, just again, to bring the whole thing down the, the circle there in terms of research, industry and teaching, we often hear about um, our, our teaching in the universities should be informed by industry. And it should be responding to the needs of industry. But that's the continuum, and it works in, in, in both directions here. Because if the university is responding to the needs of industry, it's already too late. And that's why research is key to the whole operation, research and innovation. Because if the universities are performing good applied research, they can advise industry as to what's coming down the tracks, and they can have graduates ready to, to actually um, pour those industry uh, uh, events uh, 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 these industries as, as, they're, as they're going on. Now I'm going to move along fairly quickly. These are just a, 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 um, a whole selection of companies, technical companies, technological companies based in, in the Cork and Munster region, which are supplied with engineers and scientists by, by the universities, by the Institute of Technology in the, in the past, but also by the, the further education providers in, 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 in the ETB. Um, again, just to show the, the, the crossovers we have, we have got Tyndall, uh, which is the National Institute, which, which is ma mainly UCC, but also a strong component from MTU, particularly uh, with our colleagues in Kappa, the National Maritime College, and Beaufort are developing a, a massive campus, Clone Ring Skiddy. We have the, the Center of Cork Center for Architectural Education, which Dr. Maloney is involved. We have our or incubation center in the Rubicon, similarly inside in Ignite. And this point then, folks, STEM Soul Twist, which was established maybe about two or three years ago now, under the, the direction of Michael Loftus in particular, to keep that pipeline going. I mentioned earlier, NMRC were there to provide engineers to lead industry and the electronics and the IT, ICT space. STEM Soul Twist is trying to guarantee the same thing for industries in Cork. And I give you a final example on that is, 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 is Cyber Ireland, if it's coming up next. Yeah, Cyber Ireland is Ireland's cybersecurity cluster. CIT at the time, no MTU, had very strong um, uh, background in developing business clusters. They married that business acumen with the expertise in, in, in cyber and cybersecurity, and it became the headquarters. It is now the headquarters for, for Cyber Ireland with over 100 companies involved in it. Again, I'm sure these slides will be available later on, and they will not. They won't be having a multiple choice question exam on this. So, the again, top in 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 the Cork area, we've got the top five global security software companies. Nationally, there are over forty multinational corporations with cybersecurity operations. Again, there's a whole selection of them there, um, and again, a very strong example as to where we are in terms of combining industry and and higher ed. Now. I do for my troubles as well do do some 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 accreditation work with with the French version of Engineers Ireland and just putting up this slide just to show you the the, the that what we're doing and what Engineers Ireland are doing is very much what's happening in the continent as well and I just highlighted a number of pieces there partnerships in the external environment industry research innovation international the program has to be a Bologna compliant industry placement is key maybe three to six months. And again, 
education by and for research, innovation and entrepreneurship. So again, these are the same worries, the same criteria that, that engineer, engineers are looking for in, in terms of our, of our programs in our third level sector. They also look very interestingly at student recruitment and they need the balance of male, female. They need a balance of people who are actually maybe going the apprenticeship route, become fully fledged engineers. And what's very interesting is what they do as well, they look at graduate employment, including uh, where the, the young engineers are getting, getting work and what their starting salary is. Again, very important in terms of, of, of the future of engineering. I won't go through this, this list here, but there are a, a plethora you know, of different ways, particularly in terms of, 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 of CPD, recognition of prior learning, the, the learning factor, which my colleague Matt Cottrell does a lot of work on. Cork, as you know, is a UNESCO learning city uh, and is aimed to, to develop up on sustainable development goal number four. And the next thing coming on the tracks, and it's very big in Europe, is the European University. Uh, that's a, not just a network, but an actual structure of university with partners in four or five different countries. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening in terms of uh, education, and it's not anymore, it's not just doing your degree in college and, and, and finish up there. It's, it's a lifelong learning operation. I'll finish off there, folks, with that. Uh, these are the references I used tonight. I will also include a slide roll for the civil engineers in the house, uh, so they'll, they'll feel at home. Uh, some great books, uh, Karen McCarthy, Michael Minan, and this one in the middle, which I didn't get to mention at all, but a lot of it, this, the, the great brother, uh, Dominic Burke, again, who was heavily involved in the electrification of the city. He also made the first uh, um, wooden model for... Um, for, for uh, for, 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 for the uh, first submarine, which was tested above in Fairhill, above in the mine. So, thank you for your attention. And I hope I've said on time, Mary, I'll hand you over to Dr. Mary Maloney now. And if there are any questions, we can maybe try them later on. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Barry. Um, I'll just start to share my screen. And uh... okay. This will work. Can someone confirm that that's okay? Yep, all good, yeah. Mary. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Padre. Um, so thank you very much, Barry, um, for that um, great introduction. And I suppose I have to say it is my pleasure to share the virtual stage with my um, retired uh, colleague, Barry O'Connor, um, our President Emeritus of CIT, who wonderfully led us into MTU. Um, I suppose, as Patrick has said, I'm former chair of the region of Engineers Ireland, the first female to have done so. And um, it is a great honour for me to have been invited to share this with you tonight um, on the journey. So I'm hoping to share with you, as it's a celebration of the contribution of engineers in the region over the past 80 years. And so therefore, I would just like to remind us who we are as an institution, um, what are the origins, how did we come about, where have we come from? And I suppose, how have we played such a pivotal role in the growth of the region? So um, just, I suppose, to remind people, um, Engineers Ireland is a professional body that represents us all um, with over 25,000 members. The Cork region is one of the largest, representing 12% of the national membership. And what a lot of people mightn't realize is it was the Cork Kerry region up until 1993, as far as I'm aware. Um, at which Kerry separated and became Unreacht, and the Cork region um, became the Cork region. So if we go back to 1835 and to the actual start of, um, of our institution, and when a, a group of um, gentlemen at the time decided there was a need to have a representative body for um, engineers. So the Civil Engineering Society of Ireland came about and then through a number of other discussions, um, this changed in 1844 to become the um, Institution of Civil Engineers of Ireland. And I think it's very interesting to note um, that there was a need to add respectability to the profession of a civil engineer. This was later changed to include mechanical science and engineering. So while it started as a civil engineering, um, I suppose, body, um, a representative body it very quickly grew to include all forms or all um, forms of engineering. And then in um, 1928, the uh, Common and Ingle Tory, the Engineers Association was formed. 
And the common, as it's generally referred to, um, was there to represent and look after the welfare and pay of engineers, the vast majority of who were actually public servants at the time. In 1940, the first issue of the Engineers Journal came about. And I suppose for any of you that, um, certainly in our house, with my father being an engineer, that came in through the letterbox every month. And it was, it was read religiously from cover to cover. And it was a great publication. Obviously, we've gone now more to the, towards the, um, the online version. And then in 1941, the Cork Kerry region was established, which is what we're here to celebrate this evening. These two um, bodies then decided that there was a lot of overlap and a lot of duplicity. Um, and a lot of members were members of both, um, of both organizations. And therefore they set about conversations of becoming the one, um, the one institution. So in 1969, they both merged into what is now, which was referred to as the Institute of Engineers of Ireland. And they retained the title of the common Osgoelga. So um, while it's the, it was the Institute of Engineers of Ireland, Osgoelga, it was, always, it was referred to as the common. Um, and again, one of its key roles was maintaining um, a register of chartered engineers that were practicing in Ireland. So um, if we have a pulled muscle or a bad back or whatever, we look to go to a chartered physiotherapist. If we want to have our taxes or our books audited in a professional way, we go to a chartered accountant. And thus the function, one of the key functions of Engineers Ireland is to maintain the registered, the register of chartered engineer, which is a very um, I suppose, powerful title in itself. And it, it is an act, um, the 1969 Institute of Civil Engineers in Ireland, Chartered Amend Amendment Act, where we're actually listed and the function, chartered members of the institution shall be referred to as chartered engineers. So it is very much the role of Engineers Ireland. And also this 1969 act actually also said that the Institution of Civil Engineers would henceforth be referred to as um, the IEI or the Institute of Engineers of Ireland. So thus came about the registered title and the IEI. And I suppose a pet hate of mine. The title of engineer is not protected by law and therefore, but the title of chartered engineer is. And you will notice in our cover slide that we both refer to ourselves as chartered engineers. That is our, if you want to call it our quality mark. And um, we are always encouraging our students to strive that that's what they should be trying to achieve. And when I phone Sky and they tell me they're sending out an engineer, you don't want to hear what I have to say to them. So, um, we, you know, we really need to be very um, protective of our title as chartered engineer. So Barry referred to the very strong links between our institution and between academia. And this started back really in uh, 1979 when the managing director, Morgan Sheehy, um, managing director of Arab in Ireland at the time, he was president of the institution, and himself and the director um, general of IEI, Fimber Callan, decided it was very important to develop and to forge strong links between academia and the institution. So the two of them set about visitations to all of the engineering colleges across the country um, with the aim of forging a very strong relationship out of which came accreditation. So the accreditation uh, committee was established in November of uh, 1980 with the procedures approved in 1981. And thus came about the whole um, process of accreditation, which for those of you that haven't gone through it, it's not an easy process and rightly so, it is, um, it's a very rigorous process on behalf of the institution and the academic, um, uh, the academic departments. And um, I suppose those links have continued to be very strong between the institution and CIT MTU. Um, my colleague, Norma Welsh in the faculty, um, she annually, along with myself, um, host and coordinate the STEPS programme and the I Wish Campus programme. Um, Norma is involved in an awful lot of other outreach activities, but again, forging on that very strong link, not just in accrediting programmes, but in looking to the future engineering um, students and to, I suppose, they're the feedstock of our industry, really. Um, so we, we, we run these immersive weeks with TY students on campus, um, again, with the incredible support of all our colleagues across the faculty and across the university, trying to illustrate to students the wonderful opportunities that are available to them within, within all the different branches of, um, 
of engineering. And I have to say, Barry O'Connor was incredibly supportive of all of these initiatives um, when he was our president. Here he is with Kate Lehan um, at the opening of the I Wish Campus program. And, you know, you hear this term, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, and again, this partnership with the university and and the um, institution and industry, um, it's extremely important that TY students can see where they could possibly be. So this was Sisk and Janssen at the BioCork 2, um, a, a, a enormous expansion programme, um, hosting us on, on site, um, part of the I Wish Campus Week. Um, and again, we were accompanied on this tour by one of my own former students and also a student that did her placement with CISC down there. So again, this is really opening, um, I suppose, you know, TY students, and this is this instance very much uh, female students to think about engineering. And again, on a trip like that, they're, they're exposed to all the different types of engineering. So there would have been chemical engineering, there would have been chemical engineering. So it's not just civil engineering. And again, Norma um, champions an awful lot of other initiatives as part of Engineering Week with um, Engineers Ireland and bringing primary school children um, on, on site or onto the campus. So um, our links with the institution I'm delighted to see have continued to, I suppose, now our alumni of uh, CIT, the RTC MTU, um, with, um, with Alan having been chair and Podrick in the past number of years. And it's wonderful to see that, um, and again, I suppose within the, um, within CIT MTU, we've had an awful lot of chairs that have come from, uh, from Bishopstown. My own um, vice chair was Barry Leach um, and uh, John, J John J. Murphy. And so a lot, and Martin Mannion, of course. So an awful, a very, very strong tradition of partnering with the institution. So a very particular focus of my own is trying to encourage, and I suppose support um, females to consider engineering as a profession. Um, and again, this is a photograph from my own chairmanship in 2002, 2003. In fact, this photo was taken two weeks before I had my son. And you'll notice that I'm the only female in the group. So we need engineering to be more diverse, to be more inclusive. Um, and again, the Cork region actually that year, as a committee, we decided we wanted to have an official conferring of titles. Now, if I recall correctly, we were the first region to do so where we invited our president to come and give his presidential address and to confer the title of chartered engineer, our, um, our, the um, fellowship, or the, um, the associates. So very, very important. It took another 15 years for us to welcome the second female uh, chair to the region, Kate Lehan, and Kate came and opened Engineers Week for us at, um, at CIT and delighted to report that Val Fenton, the third female, um, it only took th um, three or four years and hopefully we'll see an awful lot more females um, to chair the region um, as into the future. So Val would have opened, unfortunately, our virtual um, campus week, but the show went on at least um, and we, um, we, had our, we had our campus program, we had a virtual program in 2021. So um, I'm delighted to report that there has been a significant increase in the number of females now considering engineering. And um, this particular group are now in fourth year, but that class has 33% female. Um, so different years will vary. And again, what is one of the things I'm very interested in researching myself is what influences people are, and students to make those decisions. But we are getting there. The statistics are improving, but we have a long way to go. This is on a site visit to the BAM site at um, Horgan's Quay. So um, looking to the impact of Cork on the National Engineers Ireland agenda, many of our Cork chairs went on to become presidents of Engineers Ireland. Here, the late uh, Liam Fitzgerald was a Cork City engineer and he was president in 1993. Uh, Peter Langford, retired MD of Arab Ireland, um, chair of Cork Region, went on to be president of Engineers Ireland in 2003. Um, followed by Caff Paddy Caffrey, retired MD of Pfizer in 2004. So again, very strong voice on the national, um, on the national arena um, in Dublin, um, which is very, very important. So looking back at some old photos, because um, past, present and future, um, this is actually of um, Pat McGrath. Pat is the retired CEO of the Project Management Group. And uh, Pat was chair in 1991, and this was a gathering of some of the previous chairs, and maybe just to, to point out a few of them to you. 
uh, Hugh Pollock, um, the late Hugh Pollock, um, lectured, I'd say, to, to an awful lot of us, any of us that, 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 that attended UCC. Um, my own father, Tony Maloney, retired MD of Maliki Walsh and Partners. Um, and the late Brian O'Sullivan. Um, Brian was the harbour engineer. And Brian um, was, very, was a key influencer in the future direction of the Cork port. So in this, our 80th year of the region, um, in thinking about this presentation and what I was going to share with you, I felt it was very important that we celebrate what our contribution as engineers have been to the growth of the region. You know, um, I don't think a lot of the public realise the pivotal role that we play in delivering, in delivering projects, in delivering innovation. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of give you a whistle stop tour of some, you know, some from the past and some um, recent completions. So last week we had um, an excellent presentation on the harbour and its infrastructure links as the engine to our regional economy. But I would also like to share with you, um, I suppose, more of the growth of um, the Cork Harbour itself and the port of Cork. So um, in the 1960s, Cork was identified as a region for investment. And between the 1960s and 1973, the Southwest is recorded as having secured the largest total employment, the largest floor space and the largest grants paid by any of the grant aided industries of the IDA planning regions. So that was a very, very significant start to the growth of the industry in Cork Harbour and in Cork area. There was a very much a coordination of this investment um, with the Harbour Commissioners publish, publishing their development plan in 1972. And the IDA and Cork County Council partnered with the Harbour in, I suppose, making this happen. So in the late 60s, the IDA purchased 950 of the 2,000 acres that were available for development in the harbour and set about trying to put infrastructure or supporting infrastructure or in fact enabling infrastructure that was going to allow the harbour to grow. So I suppose Cork County Council um, were very visionary in laying a water main from Inniscarra to Ringeskiddy in the 80s, which cost in the region, it's reported of 30 million which pounds, which was a massive investment at that time. And that really opened the gate for industry to come um, to the lower harbour or to the, to the harbour. Um, and I suppose the first of those really was Pfizer. So Pfizer, as a result of two members of the Board of Management in America um, from of Irish descent, they really wanted their first big, um, they wanted their a facility from the late 60s to be located in Ireland. So in partnership with the port and with the IDA, they opened their first facility in Ringeskiddy in 1971. And the port facilities were key to that because they were at the time manufacturing citric acid and they needed to have um, a direct link between the port and the, and the manufacturing facility. And of course, um, this was one of the large, this was the first large manufacturing multinational to locate in Ireland and um, there were some smaller ones in Dublin and Waterford and this was all reported in a recent book by um, Pat McCarthy but Cork this was really the start of Cork's big pharma and biopharma sector and it led then this wonderful synergy between industry and academia it led to the need for more chemical engineers and thus um, the start of the ChemEng degree at the RTC at the time in 1979 and like Pfizer is an incredible success story with over 3,000 employees at this stage, having invested billions in our economy since it first came here in the, um, in the 1970s. And of course, this has continued to grow far the harbour, where we now have an awful lot of the um, biomedical and the biotech companies now located there as well. And again, these are all Irish engineers using their innovation and their problem solving skills to solve global problems, invent global um, needs. And an awful lot of the products that we make in Ringeskiddy are actually scaled up for tech transfer to other parts of the world. And I don't think people realize this is really an incubator bed down in the harbor, not just in the Ringeskiddy area, but in Little Island. And um, we are really, the Irish engineers are seen as being so innovative and, and so agile. And this interrelationship or synergy with academia and industry has allowed both our, our, our universities to grow and industries to grow. And there's a wonderful partnership there between the, um, our academic institutions and our industries across the region. So
So um, if I could also, this is a really unusual story here. Um, I suppose Hans Lieber, I want to focus in on the Lieber company, an incredible uh, employer again across the region. Um, Hans Lieber, um, his father was a house builder and he built his own first mobile crane in Germany in 1949. And Lieber came to Killarney in 1958 and they continued to develop their cranes and to innovate with Irish engineers, mechanical, structural and electrical. And I'm hoping this short video is going to work. Um, I'll try and ch watch the chat. But um, this is a video of three 900 tonne ship to shore cranes that were built by Lieber in Killarney um, in 2017. They were, each of the components of the three cranes were transported by road to Phoenix, where they were shipped around to Verome Dockyard, where they were assembled, and then where they were literally driven onto this enormous um, ship called the, um, the MV Albatross. And this Albatross sailed across from Verome in Ringiskiddy. Anybody who encountered it in the sea must have said, what were they watching? Um, and they docked in Puerto Rico and then were driven off as well. So an incredible feat of engineering in Killarney, in Verome, of Irish Cork Kerry engineers, a lot of them CIT structural engineering graduates and mechanical engineering graduates. I've met them there. We've had our own students on placement there. So again, another great success story. Sorry, I can move this on. So um, I'd now like to um, bring you on a tour across Cork skyline. And I suppose that, that phrase of, you know, a city rising um, and how we have come to continuously be more innovative and to strive to be better. So um, if we look at Cork County Hall, which was um, an incredible feat of engineering for structural engineers O'Connell and Harley in the 1960s. So uh, PJ Hegarty's and Sons were appointed as contractors. And actually this building only took slightly more than three years to construct. I love the health and safety of the, um, the observers. Um, up high on the scaffold, but like the amount of technology they had and to deliver this building in three years was quite extraordinary. And many mightn't realise, but Cork has been the, um, the home or the origin of PJ Hegarty's in uh, the 19, 1925 and John Siskin's sons in um, 1859 and the early origins of BAM. So we've had an awful lot of national and global brands now um, originate in Cork. So if I look to Cork skyline, I couldn't um, um, not include Holly Hill Water Tower. Um, Barry there had a photo of a scale rule. Uh, this was designed by Maliki Walsh and Partners with no calculators or computers. So um, an incredible feat of engineering, I suppose, using new technology of precast concrete. Um, so, you know, very interesting developments of its time, built in the 1960s uh, for Cork Corporation. And again, it's listed in the National Archive. So Cork engineers being recognized for their contribution. And then we look to the different to the new Elysian. Um, the Elysian was first opened in 2008, um, designed by um, Wilson Architects and, um, and Arab um, structural engineers. This was an incredible feat of structural engineering from its tall 18 story tower, but also its debasement and which had to be dewatered and there was contaminated soil. So, so many engineering challenges that were overcome in the delivery of the Elysian Tower. Um, and again, I suppose the Cork's newest um, tall tower, um, not as tall as the Elysian or the County Hall, but this is um, the Crow's Nest development, student accommodation for UCC. And this development, um, I love to bring my students on site visits and actually all of these people with me here are all former alumni of our own department, but obviously due to COVID I wasn't permitted, so they gave a virtual site visit to our students where they provided the drone footage and the photographs and shared the story of the crow's nest, which is a fantastic development in itself. And I'm delighted to report that last week I was able to bring the same bunch of students to the top of one of the towers and looking back west to the county hall. So again, this building is actually designed by MMOS structural engineers, again, um, alumni of our own department. Um, and again, an awful lot of mechanical and electrical engineering going into all of this, an extremely challenging site for the designers and the contractors in this, um, of one of the, the busiest crossroads in the city. 
so looking to the um the skyline of Cork and again if you're driving up Patrick Street which, which Patrick's Hill which not many of us do and you get a little glimpse through this little narrow alleyway here um, you will see a sign for St Angela's College. St Angela's College was first constructed on this site in 1887 and went through I suppose a phase of growth and needing to expand and needing to, to move possibly to a different location um, but they decided to stay in Patrick's Hill and to tackle the challenges of the site. So this was a Maliki Walsh um, and Partners Project um, Structural Engineering and an O'Donnell Toomey um, architects designed it. And students um, returned to the campus on Patrick's Hill in 2016. And it is a magnificent structure. Um, it's a very challenging site um, with a 17 meter slope from north to south. Such is the slope that concrete trucks were not able to be fully loaded going up the hill, if you think about that. So, you know, extremely challenging um, and some wonderful conservation for the 530 students that are now attending there with the old high school being integrated into the new campus and the old convent being integrated. So conservation of the old and development of new and some beautiful, um, I suppose, quiet spaces for the girls to enjoy the absolutely stunning view of the city. So coming to a BAM development on the south side and the very medieval part of the city, um, we talk, we look here to the Beamish, um, the Beamish Quarter on South Main Street, which has now become um, student accommodation. And hopefully um, we will welcome the, um, this, the event, the Cork Event Centre. And Barry referred to Cork Docklands and to Ford and to uh, Dunlops. We are now going through a regeneration of our city centre, which is so exciting to see. And these are some of the buildings on the North Docks, which, is, which are at more advanced um, development with Penrose Dock and Horgan's Quay. But looking east to the South Docks there, um, looking forward to some additional some future development. So no presentation on the region could be complete without our enabling infrastructure of our road network. We're very lucky at the moment in Cork to have such fantastic projects underway. The Tugkettle Interchange builds on the, um, on the Jack Lynch Tunnel project and the Dunkettle Interchange is well advanced at this stage with um, an investment from TII of 215 million. Um, incredibly complicated and complex from the point of view of maintaining traffic, but there's, um, there's very good progress and um, with sections opening in 2022-23 and um, with full opening in 2024. The McCroom Bypass is the largest infrastructure project in the region um, since the Jack Lynch Tunnel. Um, again, incredibly challenging from, um, I suppose, a geotechnical, from um, archaeological, from um, ecology, ecology, from environment and structures. 130 structures along the 22 kilometres of dual carriageway. Um, and again, I suppose here they've reached another record with the largest precast beams in Cork or in, in Ireland and the UK at 49.9 metres from Banagher in Offaly. Incredible feat of engineering and a wonderful opportunity for all of our students um, across all sectors of engineering for placement, for graduate programmes. It's wonderful to go out there. I've been following it closely and to meet all of our former students. It's absolutely fantastic project. Um, Cork Airport runway reconstruction. I happened to visit there a couple of weeks ago and I'm not sure everyone realises the scale of what's happening up there. The airport first opened in 1961 and went through a very large upgrade in uh, 2006. But runways need to be, um, I suppose, upgraded or improved on every 20 to 30 years to maintain the, the surface for, for planes. And so um, I suppose they made a very, the DAA made a very, um, I suppose, brave decision to go for a total reconstruction, a full lockdown, 10 weeks lockdown, and a 40 million investment is happening there at the moment in the runway and the power upgrade and lighting. Um, so a very exciting time for Cork as it gets ready to exit COVID. And obviously our city centre streets are going through a lot of regeneration at the moment with the old Capital Cinema here uh, in 1949 when it first opened. And now we have the wonderful uh, John Cleary development um, at the end of the Grand Parade in Washington Street. So looking to the future, what do we do? Where do we go? Its engineers are going to solve the delivery of um, the climate action plan. Its engineers, we, the members of the institution, are going to implement the EU taxonomy. 
we are going to try and ensure that we have a sustainable future and that we're wherever possible aligning with this U the UN sustainable goals, delivering on industry 4.0 and integrating it within all areas of our lives and delivering housing for all. So it's our profession. Um, and I think I'd like to congratulate the Cork region on having chosen the title celebrating 80 years. And I hope I have celebrated what all of our contribution has been over the years and to all of the former chairs that have contributed in the making of our region. So well done to all and to the committee. So I would also like you to see, and I have a lot of sources there. I am, um, I begged a lot over the last few weeks and people have been incredibly generous with photographs and images and, um, and information. So thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity of sharing. Mary, Barry, thank you very, very much for a fascinating lecture. Um, a touch on Mary's research there and, and complementing her sources. Um, I, I nearly use the word dangerous there as well, looking at some of the pictures that are coming to light uh, there tonight. And um, yeah, I'll be a lot more careful when I'm having a picture taken of future wearing chains and, and such like. Um, Barry, I hope you're after recovering there. You seem to be out of breath by the time you were finishing there. Clearing the runway for Mary. Um, Absolutely, I, I, I know, and I'm, I know, and I need to hand over the the, the, the baton. Yep. So we we've, we've a number of questions, um, and in no particular order. Um, we've had a request from one of the pan earlier panelists for a little bit more background information on um, Brother Work. Barry, if you had any. Yeah, Brother Bork was, um, there's actually, the, the, he, he was the leader of the, the what they say, he was teaching in the, the tech, as it's called, above in the, the North Monastery. And uh, the, I can actually give you the details of the book. So Noel Barry actually gave me a loan of the book. It's a book by Daniel Daniel V. Kelleher. And he, um, he was... Uh, a man who, who really was interested in vocational education and completely changed the curriculum. And I suppose in the old days, the, most of the, 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 the brothers in particular and then teaching generally was, was focused on the academic side of the house. But he actually, he actually found displays every year for the citizens of Cork, uh, things like torpedoes, electrification. He, he introduced people to, the, to, the, to the, the marvels of science and technology. Um, and and uh, again, he, he was one of the inspirations behind John Philip Holland, and and and, and generations of of of, uh, uh, of of tradespeople who became technicians, who became engineers eventually. So um, yeah, that was Brother Bork, um, James Dominic Bork. Uh, if you, many of you would have seen a lot of the the old photographs of the North Monastery, the red brick building, and that's actually known as the Brother Bork building, because right. the, the ground floor was the Gerald Griffin building. Which Brother Burke got built in memory of uh, the late Charles Griffin at the time. And then the building was completely extended and uh, an upper floor put on and was called after Brother Burke. So I can I can pass on other information on that uh, if you need. Yeah. Thanks very much. And you were mentioning books, uh, Mary. You mentioned a book by Pat McCarthy. And I was wondering what that was. Yes. Um, so it is. A History of the Irish Pharmaceutical Industry, Making Medicines for the World, Pat McCarthy. It's, um, I was kind of given it by one of my colleagues in Kemenge. Um, it is a fantastic read. Um, I think it was only launched about two or three weeks ago. Uh, President Dora Feely um, mentioned it in her presidential address as well. But it gives the, I suppose, the story behind the growth of the uh, pharmaceutical sector in Ireland. Okay, thanks. Uh, We've had a question from Barry Leach. Um, much emphasis is placed on STEM in the second level sector. Is there sufficient emphasis and resources given to the technology part of STEM? Do either of you want to comment? Um, maybe if I, I, I suppose, I presume he's, it, I presume Barry's asking this from the point of view to try and grow more technology and more technology students into third level. Um, it, it's a very difficult question to grapple with. Um, you know, not all schools offer, for instance, technology. So be it computer science, be it tech graph, be it, there's loads of different types of technologies. Uh, it's not available in all schools. That's one, that's certainly one issue. 
Um, there's obviously sciences and engineering and math. Engineering isn't offered in an awful lot of schools either. And maybe there needs to be more of that. I think an awful lot of it is, though, is um, preconceptions. It's, you know, I suppose kids having ideas that that's, you know, a stereotyping. Um, and I think that's one of the big things we need to try and break down. And I suppose that's why I try to bring, again, Michael Loftus bought psych boots for us um, from Norman Welsh and myself to bring our TY students, male and female, on construction sites uh, to try and open their mind, to bring them into Pfizer, to bring them into J&J, &J, to, you know, to open their minds that they can see that there's engineers in Cork uh, doing these really interesting projects in whatever sphere of engineering it is. Um, and gee, I could actually do that as well. So that's an awful lot of what is needed, I think. If I could just add in there, um, I remember we had a meeting in CIT some years back during SciFest and we brought in some principals from secondary schools mm -hmm. again looking at the whole idea of getting more people involved or uh, young students involved in STEM and girls in particular and um, like the answer was that we should actually we need to go back to the primary level and introduce technology introduce science to kids at at primary school level I mean if, if you if you work it through Patrick I remember seeing some figures uh, we're not just talking about here about jobs for engineers and scientists. I think one of the figures I saw some some short few years back was the business and marketing and accounting graduates from CIT was a seventy or eighty percent of those actually got jobs in tech companies. You know, okay. so 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 your 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 commerce and your business, your marketing, your finance, they need an element of of technology and science all the way through the, the all the all the way through their their education but i think it actually needs to start back at primary school level uh and for sure secondary schools as well and um, because it's already too late if students are uh, are not are not um if their interest hasn't been picked before they get into secondary school even so it's stem as a context as well as a focus yeah and i think even um so where my own daughter is going, she um, it wasn't tech craft, wasn't offered. Um, and when she was going to first year, it was offered as an, as an opportunity for her to do it as a subject. And she was immediately dismissing it. But when I explained that this is how you will draw a phone to redesign it, to make it fancier or whatever, immediately she got that and she's doing it and she's loving it. And I think that's it's it's a preconception and it's giving opportunities, as Barry says, particularly to, to primary school kids, but to open their minds, that's what we have to do. We have to open their minds to a STEM opportunities and to STEM careers. And I think that's, the, that's you know, and again, STEM Southwest, Podrick, of which you've been so involved in, um, that's one of the things there. And we need to, the, 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 you know, the pipeline of students into, um, into engineering and into technology has to be, has to be broadened. The, the one thing that came to mind about STEM Southwest there a while ago, when you're talking about the industry, uh, academia link is that that's where stem south west came from so yeah we're we're keeping that going michael laftus must have heard his name mentioned because he's asking about the importance of the so-called newer engineering dis disciplines biomedical energy engineering and so forth compared to the traditional civil mechanical how more important how much more important are these to the future of, of engineering in cork or are they Again, I think on, on that one, Patrick, they are vital in terms of manufacturing industry. They're vital in terms of the environment. You know, it's uh, and again, it's not that the third level or the further education sector, for that matter, are producing worker bees for multinationals. We're talking a lot of SMEs. We're talking a lot of uh, high level research going on as well, which will embed these companies. But you're talking about generating and training leaders for these industries so they will actually stay here. I think the progression I outlined there, just a simple example with EMC, no Dell, the way the education and the training kept up with the needs of the market, which embedded Dell in ovens or EMC and no Dell in ovens. So I, I, I think that the, the broader um, range of engineering disciplines, they're, they're interrelated. Okay. I mean, you know, they said that the French would produce a lot of what they call generalist and generalist engineers you know and if, if, if there's one thing that, that engineers can be adaptable you know there are specific disciplines as well 
but again, like biomedical engineering, is there a branch of mechanical engineering? Is there a branch of 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 of, of a combination of um, of, of, of bio, biological sciences? We have that in computational biology as well. So I think we need more and more of these mixes coming in, uh, and I'm sure the institute would be quite happy to 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 advise and accredit uh, these 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 newer degrees as well. No, no doubt. If, if, if if I maybe could come in on that as well, I think, you know, um, and I suppose one of the things that we're working with is interdisciplinary work. I keep saying to students of, say, structural engineering, when you leave structural engineering, it's the last time you'd only ever be working with structural engineers on your own again. Because the minute you go into a project, you've got all the forms of engineering. So you've the electrical, you've the mechanical, you've the chemical work, depending on the area you're working in. And so we're investing a lot of time in developing interdisciplinary projects because they need to understand the different disciplines that are out there. And I suppose, you know, at an engineering education level in the lower years, in the earlier years, we're building the building blocks for students to specialize as they go up. Um, and, you know, I think we'll probably see more of that. I keep, and also, you know, we talk about biomedical engineers, uh, biomedical engineering, that's small structures, right? Are we talking about McCroom? It's a big structure. So are we talking about um, electronic chips? That's a nanostructure. So, you know, we're, it, there's an awful lot of inter, like I suppose myself, I worked with Pfizer for years. Most people assumed I was a chemical engineer. Um, I wasn't, you know, I'm a civil structural. So, you know, there is a lot, a lot of crossover. And I suppose that's one of the things. And again, the accreditation, I keep coming back to it. The accreditation process and the fact that at MTU, we have an academic extern and we have an industry extern that we're satisfying both requirements. That is really, really important. And there might be new disciplines that we haven't quite figured out yet in the years to come or in the generations to come. Um, you, Barry, you, you referred to the, the European connection. And um, one of our attendees is just curious to know what links are there between Cork colleges and European colleges, if any, at this time? I do know that UCC have been successful in establishing a, a pilot project in terms of this EU university. And th these are going to happen. And they're going to happen more so because of Brexit, because again, the likes of Macron are, are in, in France are really pushing this. And it's about, and it's not just exchanging students, it's developing actual programs, giant programs. And again, I know we, we, we've done it with, we've done it with, with, with UCC in terms of MTU and UCC. We've done it with Darmstadt in Germany. So it, it is happening and it, it will happen more because, again, I think the, the, the EU Commission in terms of Erasmus Plus and what's following on from that, they want this embedded. They want universities working together as one university. Uh, so it, it is, there's, there's, there's good money going for it in terms of the European Commission. You know, the French government put a lot of money into it for sure. And I know in MTU, there are a number of projects that are being considered as well. Uh, so, so it will happen. And I know for sure in terms of, it'll be one of the, one of the follows from, from Brexit is that we will have, we will be in great demand in this country to, to work with the mainland European countries in terms of university education. Thanks. We've had two comments from Charles Smith, um, thanking Mary for the excellent talk. And of course, uh, saying it would be great to see some prototype model buildings in primary schools to ignite children's imagination. So there you go, heard it here first, Mary. And also, I suppose in response to Barry's answer just now, it would be great to see more engineers with European language skills. I know Barry's no laggard in this regard himself. Uh, um, and I would agree, having spent some time in Greece previously, that we tend to be a little bit lazy in that regard in this country. Maybe it's the, the island nation or whatever, but do either of you have thoughts on that? Yeah, but I think a lot of engineering across Europe happens through English as well. Um, you know, which is, um, now Barry is, is, uh, is fluent in French. Imagine an undertaking an accreditation in French. I couldn't even think about it. Um, but um, it has been offered, languages have been offered as an alternative in both CIT, um, MTU and UCC. And there hasn't been a great uptake in it. So, um, is it because of how we think? But an awful lot of the large infrastructure projects across Europe, I do know, are happening through the medium of English. Um, so if you're going to be involved in these large projects, Barry has a differing opinion. I have. I, my, my, I, I, for sure, um, a lot of work happens in, it happens in English. 
But the reality is, you know, if you're trying to if you're trying to buy a service, you can buy in any language you like. But if you're trying to sell a service to to another country, you got to sell it in their language, you know. And again, there is this logic out there, or this false belief that, you know, you're either good at maths or you're good at languages. So that's not true at all. You know, I mean, the, 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 for, for sure, I mean, as I, I do these French accreditations, and they really beat themselves up if the, in terms of the, having a high standard of English, you know. And, and again, it's, it's, and it's not just the language either. It's about the cultural side of it that, they, 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 you, you know, it's about learning how a different system works, learning how it works in Germany, how it works in France, in Scandinavia. And it's, 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 it's tough going. No, I, I would also comment, Mary, in terms of some of the, 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 the language course that might be given in universities. Uh, I, I think it, is, it could well be the wrong type of language. You don't need to do studies in literature to be able mm. to sit down and, 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 and discuss an engineering topic with colleagues in Germany or France, you know. But it's also showing that there is, it is trying to develop this multicultural uh, approach and, and, and mindset in our student engineers. And uh, again, look, the, 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 the kids will come out of secondary school with four or five years of French or Spanish or German. It doesn't take a whole lot just to, 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 to and it's not about plays or poetry or drama, important knowledge there. It's about the language of communication. And if you go, and it, you know, it, 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 I, I think it, it, it gives a completely different dimension and opens up a world of opportunities and uh, for, for our students. You know. okay, thank you for that. Mary, one last one for you. You you're flying the flag for women in STEM for sure, right? And the first chair of the Cork region, first female chair of the Cork region, and we Val this year. Um, what kind of a trend do you see across the varying, if any, across the other all the disciplines of engineering? So, is female involved participation in civil structural stronger or weaker than it is, say, electronic or biomedical or? Um, so there's, there's, so biomedical is very strong female. I don't have the statistics, um, but it would be certainly, I would imagine approaching 50, 50, um, uh, in our own department, we're certainly, um, we're, we're 20, 30%, um, elect tends to be lower. Um, chemical is very high participation female. I, again, you're, it's close, you know, you're hovering around the 50, 50 mechanical. We have some fabulous role models and um, so the first female for a long time who has who has now got she started the Y STEM Society Orla McGowan and um, with Kira Sheehan uh, joined her in second year from common entry and they're now they it's that type of role model is really having an impact on other students say for instance from common entry and again our own department has had a very strong number of female role models and I suppose again, it's this acronym of if you can't see, if you can't see it, you can't be it. They really are acting as wonderful role models um, for the upcoming students and for the TY students and for the primary school kids as well. So um, you know, it's it's that to continue and support and encourage more of, of those students to undertake that work. Thank you. I think that's about it. I think Barry started with you don't know Jersey tonight right <laughs> i'm of the, the opinion i don't or didn't know cork uh, for sure um uh, there's so much stuff that i didn't know um about you know, the origin of submarines and where it all started on the north side and wooden prototypes and such forth like that i knew nothing about right and there there's certainly a few books that are going to have to make their way into the leahy household uh, um mary um I actually saw the pipeline being built to ring a skiddy as a as a yeah. child. Um, don't don't pass near the back of my house um, tonight. And I had an idea of the context of it. And tonight's the the first time that I got the full context of it, shall I say? Right. So the story of Cork and the importance of the profession um, to the development of Cork and and the region as a whole. And also the the link and the importance of the the education sector in the Cork region. I didn't fully appreciate the context of that. I thank you both for a very fascinating uh, teamwork display tonight. Um, I this lecture is being recorded. 
I suspect that all or parts of it certainly will be used by entities such as STEM South West going forward, right? And I'd venture it would make very good watching for parents and students in in particular secondary school, second level, if, if not earlier, um, when it comes to considering careers, right? Because, yeah, absolutely fascinating. A lot of detail unknown. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for well, inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.